So I had a very great fun security exchange commission inquiry. And that was, I mean, it was the darkest times of my life. And it was thanks to that wrong mindset. Hmm. The wrong mindset that high paid executive is going to build a company in perpetuity. I mean, make it great again, right? <laughs> and, and that was my <laughs> biggest mistake. This is Startup to Storefront. Today's guest is Roy Deckel, co-founder of Set Schedule. For decades, realtors would have to go through the motions, sorting through leads, calling those leads to verify their authenticity, and then doing their homework about the property in order to make the sale. Roy realized that machine learning and AI could drastically expedite this process, and thus Set Schedule was born. Today, it is one of the fastest growing real estate companies in the US, but all that success did not come easily. So listen in as we cover everything from why Set Schedule is not for sale, the importance of questioning authority figures, and Roy's advice to rent, not buy, in today's real estate market. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. We're here with Roy from Set Schedule. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Tell everybody the quick, what is Set Schedule? Oh, there's no quick version. It's going to take an hour. Good, good, good. <laughs> so Set Schedule, actually you can... Trace it back to the origin of the name. That's kind of like what we are. We, we are a company that obsesses over time management, utilizing technology, but we're specifically addressing it in the space of real estate. Yeah. So now if I have to kind of like zoom in, basically what it is, is we built several platforms with a core product, which we call the referral radar. And the cool thing about the product is kind of like an agnostic marketplace of real estate leads. And the marketplace aggregates all of these leads from all of the well-known sources that, that like you're Redfin, aware of. Zillow, Zillow, all of those guys, Homes.com, okay. Realtor.com, Facebook. I mean, all of them. And the marketplace basically aggregates them, machine learns them, and serves that to the end user, which is the, the licensed pro, okay. real estate agent, broker, teams. And uh, traditionally, they pay, right? So if I'm a realtor, I'd pay some money to to get that those leads from like a Zillow or a Redfin, or how does that? What's the traditional way? So we we completely revamped the traditional way, right? The right. traditional way is you go to a publisher, aka Zillow, right? Mm -hmm. And you sign a six months agreement and you basically buy a certain zip code. You commit to a certain zip code. Okay. And based on your commitment, you get a certain amount of leads generated and you take them, work them, hopefully transact as a real estate agent. Got it. Um, we kind of like flipped to turn the table on this concept, right? Okay. And what we created is basically we created predictability around the consumption of leads. So in simple terms, if you're a pro, then now you can go download the app for free, create a desktop user, right, for free, and you're able to look in real time in your specific area and see what you have available in terms of inventory. And the reason that you could do that is because we're actually taking the risk uh, through our partnership with Zillow and homes.com okay. and realtor.com. And, and, and we cultivate those leads. We receive them kind of like Amazon, right? So yeah. they're the merchants. I mean, they're the publishers. We aggregate that through technology. We bring it to our marketplace and we serve it to our end users. And you vet them somehow. You score them somehow. We score everything. Yeah. So, so yes, we, we vet and nurture and track, score uh, the consumers, for lack of a better term, we work with the consumers. We engage with the consumers through our technology and nurturing systems. If we have positive engagements, these leads become verified leads. So they're the set schedule or the set verified leads, and they go into the marketplace with a different uh, UI. Different price point. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Different UI, different price point, different different engagement. Yeah. And the agents, which are scored also in a certain, you know, obviously ratios based on their engagement with the system, go and consume uh, this lead. So they, they know it's fully transparent platform. If this is a non verified, you know, Facebook lead, or this is a verified Zillow lead, mm -hmm. um, they're completely different. And from a pricing perspective, obviously it depends on your engagement with the system and the type of user that you have, whether you're a stunt, I mean, a starter user or, or a premium user, um, your engagement and your cost basis is different. How did you first start the company? What was the idea? How did it come to you? Were you a realtor at one time? You're in real estate. So that's a funny question. I was never a realtor. I have all the respect in the world for obviously, to, you know, the pros that work very hard every day. But my journey actually started as a real estate investment manager. We traded, I traded, I managed hundreds of properties. Um, at some point post-recession, uh, I would buy some around four, five, six uh, properties per month. Um, we would probably bid on 20, 30 per month. Okay. And we realized, and we did it in California and we did it in Texas, and we realized that, th that through that process, we have so much access to real estate and realtors and, and, uh, and, and we consistently mm. buy and, and hold 
we, we did buy and hold residential rental uh, portfolio. And we realized that we can possibly take some of that, that inventory and instead of buying ourselves, we can possibly market it to a third party investors. And from there, we kind of like developed the idea of, hey, maybe we can build a nationwide agency or brokerage and start selling and buying real estate, not just buying, holding and obviously building a portfolio. And that, that's, that's where it started. What was the pain point for you? Was it you were just going through so many realtors, it was hard to find a good one? Like, what's the problem? What, what was the problem that you encountered? Too many realtors, no inventory, no quick way of... So, so the problem the was, was three tiers. Yes. The first one, which is the most obvious, is when you need to trade 20, 30 houses a month and you have very aggressive goals of buying real estate properties, you realize that you, you're subjected to the availabilities of the agents, the level of their interest in, in, in building right. uh, their, their book of business. So that was number one issue. Obviously, you realize that you pay a certain commission, you pay a certain fee, and and, and, right. and you want to be able. No one's happy to do that, by the way. <laughs> well, no yes, one. it has been it has been an issue for the longest time. But I gotta say right now that I believe that the commissions are just. I believe that good professionals in the space should get paid commissions for sure. And you know, so so this is not the, the, the friction point is not paying commissions. The friction point is the ability to scale with some some individual agents because not all agents are the same and a lot of them got, got into business for the wrong reasons. Yeah. So when you need to scale a, a large pool of investment, you say to yourself, okay, maybe I can put a couple of agents on payroll and start buying these. So that's right. where the thought process started when we really had some agents on payroll and we developed the idea of, okay, well, let's buy and sell also for others because we have the agents on payroll, All right? That was kind of like the mindset. Right. And that was step one. And that was the first friction point. And then when we went to the second phase, which quite frankly, that's what the industry deals with, with every day, we realized that we have problem of, of actually now inventory to feed the payroll agents, right? We realized that we need to, to market, we need to aggressively find leads, home shoppers. I mean, you know, people yeah. are looking to buy or sell or rent. It's like a two-sided or, market. You have to solve both. Right. Yeah. So we realized that we're spending a lot of time figuring out where we want to how we want to address the inventory issue. And uh, there's a constant fluctuation with that problem, right? With, with, with inventory. So we basically said, okay, let's, let's, let's partner. Let's go the traditional way. Let's go to Zillow and, and sign a contract, pay five times the amount when an average Joe would pay for as an agent, right? We right. sign a great contract and, you know, for six months we generated a tremendous amount of leads. Um, but we realized that there's, that was the, the, the last straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, and created the birth of, of set schedule. We realized that now we have a lot of leads. We have the paid salaried agents. We have the concept of going nationally, but we're dealing with so many uncertainties. When, when is the lead going to come in? Is it going to be a good lead? Can I somehow vet the lead before I take the lead? Right. Can I, you know, can I even close it? Is it right for me? Because this lead of a condo, let's say, uh, uh, you know, a uh, uh, $500,000 condo in Laguna is not what I'm specialized in. I'm better servicing a single family home. So we had a lot of friction points around that area. And I actually, during that time, worked with one of my best friends uh, that became my partner where uh, I sat down with Udi, that's my partner, and, and, and Udi kind of like looked at the concept and said, why are you trying to figure it out for a couple of salaried agents when you can actually build build this thing to scale and, was he, and build was, a technology? Was tech his background? Yes. Or? Okay, got yes. it. Yeah, so he's looking at it. Yeah, yeah. He, he's looking yeah. at it from, from, from no, the tech you know, perspective, right? And he said, let's, let's scale it through some technology. And that was kind of like the birth idea of set schedule you know, respect your schedule and have it done through an agnostic marketplace where we will aggregate the leads, bring them over and serve them to you. You just pick it up. And as you pick up more, the marketplace will study your behavior and will create predictions. So that that's the birth uh, of the whole company. Situation. So was, was Udi your first, your first hire, first full-time person on board? He's my first and only partner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So he and I partnered around 2014. And really rolled it out in 2015, mid-15. Uh, the funny thing is that we, we took our time with R&D. It took us two and a half years to roll out front-facing consumer or, or I should say pro. Realtor-facing. Yeah, the realtor-facing yeah. uh, mobile app and desktop app. And uh, around April of 2018, that came out. And whew, since there, we're 20,000 agents nationwide strong and we're growing a thousand plus per month. Do you consider yourself an agency in some way or you just partner with the agencies? How do you view your business? It's a very good question. I love that question, actually, because, you know, when we talk to the publishers, right, the partners, the, the Zillow of the world, 
you know, they're, they're looking at many different ways to verify and deliver a lead and bring it to the pro. Yep. So from the perspective of lead generation, we're not new, but right, right. You're deep, smarter, right? Smarter, more tech based and more scalable right. than anything else. And the beauty of it is that our focus and the, 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 the large aspect of the re revenue for us is actually revenue share. So we're 2080. We take 20% okay. commission share from all of our users when they close a transaction, whether it's a rental or whether it's an investor that buys 10 properties yeah. from, from, you know, from, the, from the user or the realtor. That took so the you, lead. you have a SaaS business model and you have a commission-based model, yes. an agency model. Okay. So, so to answer your question, we are basically a technology company, but our approach to revenue is very much brokerage referral. Got it. Did you pick 80-20 because of the, the SEC? And their breakdown of how they treat. So, so basically, SaaS revenue is uh -huh. uh, you have to report it, but twenty percent of that can be like customer integration fees, or in this case, like commissions. It's that smart. Did you know that? No, I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> yeah. So, so it sounds like a perfect split of the two, which is pretty cool. No, to answer your 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 question, the reason we did it is because we wanted to be the best and wanted to be the most economical. Right. See, I mean, a lot of agents get into. I mean, there's two million licensed agents, and you know, the United are, States. Yeah, wow. yeah, and 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 actually, it's funny because I mean, we get agents from Canada and from the UK that are asking to to join the platform, but right now we're a US based platform. A lot of the agents, the 2080 kind of thing, you know, a lot of them don't have the budget and really struggle to compete with with a killer agent of that course. has 15, 15 sub agents in their team. So we really obsess over or really make a point to be as economical as possible. Uh, most agents can pay when they close a transaction, but they don't necessarily can or, or want to pay upfront. And we want to create the upfront aspect very, very user friendly and economical. Yeah. And that's the reason we went also with the 2080. Uh, the few competitors that we have in the space are much higher in commission share. There are a couple of other referral companies okay. that are in a 25, 30, 35 percent rate. And we said, you know, even on the back end, we want to be the most competitive. And that's why we dropped it to 20 percent. Did you ever have to raise money or because you were effectively paying the commission, right? You're getting commissions based on. On the salaried employees that you have, did you did you not have to raise any capital? We had to okay. raise capital because development is not cheap. Totally. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Is your team local or are they are they based? So so we're we're all over the place. I mean, the business, the the home base is or the corporate office is in Irvine. Mm -hmm. uh, we have it about we have about fifty staff members in Irvine, uh, but we have also about. 60 staff members offshore and in satellite offices. So we're at about 110 strong, give or take, full-time employees. Nice. We have a tremendous amount of, obviously, contractors and partners. But uh, most of the uh, the development is done in Irvine. Mm -hmm. Sales, inside sales is done in Irvine. So, yeah, I mean, we, we really, uh, very early on, we realized that we need to focus on r the right development. That's why we took our time and actually brought the developers in-house. What do you view today as the hard part of your business? Just in terms of, is the hard part getting more houses, mm -hmm. getting more realtors, uh, maybe training the realtors? I don't know if you guys are doing that a little bit to just have a better experience with the home sellers. What's the, the pain point? I think the pain point was and still is getting as many realtors as possible satisfied. Okay. The challenge is that we, unlike some other competitors in the space, we don't really discriminate. We don't only work with the top 10% or the top 1%. Mm -hmm. We really open the door and we make it very economical to everybody uh, join and utilize the platform. I mean, 90% of the SaaS products inside the Set Schedule app are free. You can use a CRM okay. free. You can use the Resource Center free. You can have an open house visit visitor management free. You can have wow. a lot of the data for free. The only thing you really pay for or, or, or have a commitment to from a commission standpoint is the leads that you're taking from the marketplace. And we're actually going to announce some exciting things with additional free software that we're going to roll out this summer. So the problem, though, is because of that, we get tremendous amount of agents that should uh, seek some coaching and more training. And, sure. and, and yes, we're, we're, we're addressing it by creating more webinars and more uh, remote training. We are actually planning to budget for local training pretty, you know, in the near future, not pretty soon, but in the near future. So training our partners is our biggest challenge. Yeah. And obviously internally, uh, you know, it's all about development. So the biggest challenge is to, 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 to be able to spit out a product roadmap in a reasonable time frame from a development totally. standpoint. That would be the second. Is there That's resistance hard. from the agents to get more training? It sounded like there was a bit of a pushback on their end. I, I don't think that there's tremendous amount of resistance to okay. training, but I think that um, continuation of training 
and and being persistent and staying on top of your personal development and your hardship and challenges uh th- that's where the problem is i mean it's it's we, we can get our partners to to get on a call or a webinar and train but this is not a one you know one day show right this is this is on average i mean if you want to do something as a realtor or as a as any service provider really you have to plan six months, 12 months out. And unfortunately, a lot of people in this space and many other uh, industries quit very quickly. That's what I was thinking could be your challenge. So in some way you're democratizing the advantage, right? Right. If everyone's getting good leads, it's, it's amazing. And then Mm -hmm. if you're building CRM tools and ways for them to stay on track, Mm -hmm. then you've democratized that completely. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you're elite, like let's pretend you're top 2% realtor (laughs) and you've democratized that that also helps them a significant amount because now they're relying on what they're already great at closing the conversation, the empathy, whatever it might be in the selling process. I'm very upset because you actually stole my line. Okay. <laughs> I use the term <laughs> democratize the lead consumption and business development every day. Yeah. And I love the fact that you picked up on it because that's what we do. I mean, instead of creating this one, one, one way street contractual relationship where sit and wait for your leads to be generated by a website you just sign up with or whatnot. We created really a full uh, democracy around consumption, around- uh, Totally. So it has its its advantages and disadvantages. I mean, as many many people in the space would know, like I said, that that at the end of the day, you can do so much to feed, you know, individuals. So- Again, that, that, that has been the biggest friction point, but we're definitely solving it. I mean, the products we're bringing out to market are solving it day by day. For sure. I was just thinking like, if you're a rock star salesperson and you want to become a realtor and you're trying to deconstruct the risks, I think the obvious ones, right? So for people listening, the obvious ones could be, I don't have a network. I, I just moved into, let's say LA. I'm new to LA. I don't know anybody here. And I think there's a, there's a myth in real estate where if you're successful, it's because you have a network here or your parents were here or you grew up here. And so, you know, when like Auntie Donna and all her cousins on the street that you grew up with are selling their house and they think of you because they've known you since you were a kid. There's like this perception of that here in L.A. Well, I mean, I I think there's a bigger perception and actually lends itself to the two million licensed individuals. Right. Is that it's not that difficult, that it's actually not that difficult that if uh, you get your license, you can make a killing because if you sell one home in Los Angeles or one home in Newport (laughs) Beach, oh, gosh, you're making forty thousand dollar commission. Right. Right. I mean, sell a million dollar home. That's twenty five thousand dollar easily gross commissions. Right. Right. Uh, but it's a broken perception. It's it's no different than any other business. And that's why I believe, I don't have the accurate statistics, but I think that, what is it, 30% churn, meaning quitting the industry after a year and four months. And uh, uh, most, I mean, tremendous amount of agents don't don't renew their license after two years. Hmm. So, and, and it's, it's, it's sad. I mean, I kind of like mission that, statement is to fix that. But. It weeds out <laughs> yeah. the people who don't really want to. I mean, are those people, do you have any idea of the statistics if those people are even making a sale in those year and four months or two years? Or are they just getting frustrated that they've only made X amount of sales and they were in their head, they maybe were thinking more? So I'm going to use a line that was provided me by a vice president of sales for a brokerage that actually we started with when we tested the product and we came up with this membership model and set schedule before we even had the user interface app. And that vice president of sales, which is, was in charge of training every Monday morning, 30, 40, 50 agents in the brokerage would come and hear him talk about sales cycles and sales process. And I sat down with him and I said, what do you think about this concept? This is how we're going to structure it. And he said, you guys are too expensive. And I'm talking about a thousand dollars, nine ninety five. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking right. about you know, and and he says you have to realize that hmm. most of the agents in our office would average twenty thousand dollar commission for the year. And oh wow! Yeah, that's a huge. Disparity. That was my that was yeah. my whoa. That was my reaction, and I said, okay. Well, I have two problems with that. Respectfully, first off, I have I have a problem with your perception of your of your agents. You should obsess over making totally. them better. Yeah. yeah. And number two. I have a problem with a number. So uh, if that's the number, that means we need to find ways to solve that problem. And I feel like we're, 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 we're trying, and I, I hate to use the term trying because that's the intention to fail, but we're trying to win that. Yeah. We're trying to solve that. And inevitably, because of that, we get slapped in the face sometimes with, with whether it's reviews or bad publicity, which, you know, obviously, I hey, think is It comes unjust. with the territory, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you think about partnering with brokerages then? So it's like basically they should be buying all the leads for the agents. 
Does that? So we already are. You're doing, doing that. The B2B yeah. model? Yeah. Yeah. So we actually rolled out the brokerage and teams ecosystem in the end of last year. Well, actually, it's, it's six months ago. And we've done well. I mean, now we have multiple uh, users engagement process. Now the ecosystem, the marketplace, and all of the products that, that, that we roll out go, for, go out for single users and multi-users. So uh, we definitely see the multi-users as a much better, more stable environment where the agents are more stable or they're stronger because, because they have the help of, of an ISA and an inside assistant that, that nurture the deals. And uh, we're very happy with the teams. I want to go high level for a second. Just, I, I can't stop thinking about this. So when I think about companies like Compass, who I'm sure you're familiar with, and mm-hmm. be themselves as the tech company, and they're doing a lot of that, right? They're trying to democratize, but they're also having their little brokerages, let's say in LA, but they get all the tools. Do you view yourself as a monster acquisition target for anybody who wants to come into this space? Because you're already solving so much of that, mm-hmm. right? Yes. But you're also ahead, I would say, in some categories. Yes. And so how do you view where your company is going? How do you view, you know, it's 2020. I always like to say we're starting a new decade. <laughs> how do you? So I don't he's think smiling I so, so big right now. <laughs> I don't think some I can plans. share that. that. That's a confidential <laughs> information right there. No, I, it's funny. Compass is actually a client. We have tremendous amount of agents totally. that are, are, are clients in Compass. I respect them. I appreciate them. Uh, but but we're very different. I mean, we are a tech company. Compass is more of a brokerage company. Totally. Um, yes, they have tech, but they're a brokerage company. We're agnostic. We don't license any agents underneath us. We don't have employee agents. Yeah. We have developers <laughs> as right. employees. Uh, but with tens of thousands of agents, you know, and thousands coming in regularly, um, where we're going with this is um, actually because we have the flexibility of the technology and because we have the flexibility of a unique engagement where we're not the employing broker, we're the technology product that provides the end user with so many solutions. We actually see ourselves actually quadrupling our agent count okay. within the next couple of years. And not just that, we're actually going to roll out a complete new product at the end of the summer. And that's all I can say today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is going to it's hug gonna... <laughs> all of the sister and brother professionals to the real estate agent. So any pro that that benefits or contributes to a real estate transaction would be able to benefit and use the product and the platform they're going to roll out at the end of the summer on a much greater scale than nobody has provided before but the north star right at least is directionally correct from an acquisition i assume you that's your goal maybe right what exit be, yeah of course no i'm, I'm the warren buffett of the <laughs> business i want to have an entry plan not an exit plan you want to acquire i believe my oh to acquire yes yeah yeah, yeah. if that's what was the question Yes, yes. I want this company to be, you know, big and nice for my kids. That's that's <laughs> that's the mindset for us. Got it. Uh, I mean, look, let's face it. We do not have a single institutional VC in the company. I don't believe that VC money is always right. I think actually it's wrong in many instances. Uh, well, we why, have, why do you think it's wrong? Not that I disagree. I'm just curious to hear your, your take. Well, because you have to, first of to answer that question, you have to reverse engineer the answer. You have to ask who is a VC? Well, a VC is basically a money manager that gets 1% asset under management or 2% asset under management and 20% kicker if a sell takes place. So they're making money based on the amount of capital they have or deploy. Yep. And they also make money the faster or when they liquidate the asset, right? And I think that most VCs don't really care about the founders that they invest in. Yes, they're going to say they care. And yes, they're going to say that they'll be around for 15 years with the founders. But in truth... They They're probably pay. looking at five years time horizon. Yeah. You know, in five years, I need to show my pension fund or my institutional investor that there's return on investment and or else why am I paying you, meaning pension fund to VC, why am I paying you the 2% that's not a management every year, right? Right. So there is lack of alignment in interest. Uh, I think that the idea of, okay, let's plug in a lot of high paid executives and pump the business and make it great. Well, you can probably do that, but it's not going to be a company that your grandkids are going to know about. Totally true. That's, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. and I can use a lot of companies' examples, but you know exactly, you, know, you can yeah, think yeah. about five different examples of, as to why, why is it true. So so there's no alignment, and I've been around the block. I made those mistakes before. I know that okay. high-paid executives are not the right thing for the company. Oh, sure. I mean, I brought in high-paid executives to crush my businesses before, so I know I know that it, you have to make sure that the founders stick around and give their love to the business, and that's what really builds the 
you know, the long-term businesses. You don't hear about um, JP Morgan Bank founders being right. the VCs that invested in JP Morgan. You hear JP Morgan was part of the company for many years until he died. I love that. That's like a centennial type of mindset, not so much a decade type of mindset. Yep. In terms of, let, let's give some advice to some people. You said you paid some high, high-end high executives or some high-paid execs. What, what was it that went wrong with them? Was it they were just out of touch? They had been, you know, I have my own stories. I'll share them. Right. Yeah. I'll just share them now. And then <laughs> I'd love to hear that. Yeah, yeah. So from my perspective, it was always like um, when I was, I would say just coming up in the game, yeah, I think I was an engineer by background, civil engineering. And then my first job in the tech world was in sales. And so I was like, oh, they're bringing in some expert, right? And this guy, this person was just like some unicorn mm-hmm. or so they, you know, that's how they would sing his praises and he came. And I was just asking him all these questions. Like I was like, hey, you're unicorn, blah, blah, blah. Heard this. What's your strategy? How do you do it? And then they would tell me their process, their strategy. And I was always just so disappointed. I was like, that's it? Like, that's not even, that's not even today's America. Like, it's almost like they were telling me about the fax machine and how cool it was. And I'm like, we've reached an era where like, why are we using email, right? We should be using text. We should, like, I, I didn't, the mm-hmm. whole process was just stagnant to me. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, you just didn't evolve. That's how I looked at it. I was like, oh, I see. You were great at one time. Mm-hmm. And then the game changed and you, you didn't. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, so that's been my experience. Is yours similar? Oh, that and worse. <laughs> and I like sharing it. So I had a very great fun security exchange commission inquiry. And that was, I mean, it was the darkest times of my life. And it was thanks to that wrong mindset. Hmm. The wrong mindset that high paid executive is going to build a company in perpetuity. I mean, make it great again, right? <laughs> and and that was my <laughs> biggest mistake. That's funny. My biggest mistake. In 2008, I started a company called Diverse Financial with then uh, a friend of mine. And, uh, you know, pretty quickly he quit the business. But the important thing was that a year into the business, we made millions, millions in net profits, right? It was crazy. And um, that's great. And, and okay. It, yeah, it's great. But yeah, then what's next, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And it was here in LA. <laughs> and the first thing that came to mind was how do we build this to scale? We're in financial services, we're in the life insurance space. How do we build this thing to scale? And the first thing that came to mind was let's hire executives. They're going to run the company with great background. They're going to run mm. sales. They're going to run operations. They know how to build business. Let's let's hire you know them so they can bring a hundred sales executive, financial advisors, you know, right. what have you. And um, and we brought we bought the, these these sales executives and the executive vice president that became president of the business. And the long and short of it, 2010, 11, 12, it, it, it turned out to be the worst years of our lives. I mean, these people just bled the company dry. And the problem is, as a kid, as a youngster, if you will, right, I was 27 years old, 26, 7, 8. Yeah, so go, you know, getting to my 30s, you realize that these 60 plus year old executives, they're not in it for the company. Right. right, they're in it for the profit sharing, the bonus, the, the the salary. Right, they're not, they're not in it for the founders' love that you were into it. And and you're talking about a company that had millions of dollars in cash, yeah, that vaporized. Right, uh, and every time where we had to have this uncomfortable conversation, of, let's change the course, let's you know roll out a different product and whatnot. The answer was no, no, and you have to keep paying. Right. To keep paying me, <laughs> and um, and it, it came to a hold. Obviously, we basically stop operations, and we required obviously to uh, to did liquidate the funds. Did you give them equity? Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But even that Equ- wasn't equity enough. was the easy part. I right. Mean, yeah. But the annual bonuses and the salaries that that was the that was the tough part, right? And uh, and, and and there were a couple of mistakes that I mean I've learned a lot from the experience, right? Number one is if the product doesn't work, just cut ties. I mean, just just kick the bucket and and, totally and move true. on. Totally the, true. It's it's you know that's problem number one. Now I, here's a problem when you deal with executives like that. They don't know what to do with the other product. They don't have the idea of coming with another sure. product. I mean, if I hired a higher up executive now in set schedule, yeah. right? I mean, they wouldn't be able to to articulate a half of what we have in our product roadmap. So, so that's a big issue. The second big issue is that nobody has the founder's love and nobody has the you know the the, the, the ability to do what you really can do. Yeah. I mean, I I like to use the example of Disney, for example. There's tremendous amount of difference between Roy Disney. Being at the top and all the other executives at the Bob top. Bob Iger, okay. Uh, all right, yeah. Well, now, yes. That's Soon true. to be the replacement. I don't remember his yeah, name. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But but the, the truth of the matter is when you go to the parks, 
I mean, it's still, I mean, maybe I'm too nostalgic, but there's a big difference between the Disney family managing the Disney parks and other executives. They're talented and it's a publicly traded company, but you still see the difference in the way that the cast is being managed in, in those parks and all of obviously the, the, you know, the management of the, the organization. So, so the thing is, is, it's really important to understand that as long as you are able and capable to run your business, you should stick around, don't outsource or hire your job to someone else. Right. Just hire the experts around you. Yeah. So yeah. then would you rent, recommend bringing people up through the system? Because then they have that, that institutional love for what you're doing as opposed to bringing people on from the outside. Because that's a big thing that I've heard about with companies like, say, Microsoft. Mm -hmm. I think they, uh, the CEO's name, Satya Nadella, he is a guy who came up through the company. And so when they were hiring a new CEO, they looked around, but they decided that the best CEO for them was someone who knew the intimate workings of the company itself, rather than go pluck someone who used to be at Chase or PepsiCo or whatever it might mm -hmm. be. Is that is that your philosophy? Absolutely, and you give a perfect example. Yeah. The soda water and Jesus, Steve Jobs, right? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, that's 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 you know, uh, John Scully is probably a very talented guy, right? Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is that what happened with Steve Jobs was the worst thing that ever happened to Apple. And the same thing, I mean, the same kind of like philosophy that, that you're mentioning as an example with Microsoft in our company. We really promote from within. We make the point, kind of like my naval days, right? Military, special ops days. You have to You're promote a military from, man? We'll talk about it in a second. Okay, yes. okay. We'll get there. Drop it. Drop <laughs> it on us. How did you know? I thought you knew all of that. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So, like, But like military. Military is a phenomenal machine. I mean, you have your specialty. You go through core special training, and then you can be plugged in so many different units based on your core competency and your 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 certifications right and it's a huge organization the military right so we do kind of like the same thing i mean we have this great boot camp training with hell week training for sales and we really nurture and cultivate business development and 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 the six sigmas and go you know build your marketing machine and your closing process and nurture your 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 clients and then they go to the business consultants the partners consultant right which is which is a different department, but everyone in a partner consultant had to be a graduate from the sales team. Hmm. So if they didn't do pre-sale, they're not going to do post-sale in our company. Yeah. And if they do pre-sale and post-sale, they can very well be promoted or moved uh, to media and content and marketing. And so, so we really cultivate from within. That's so smart. Let's talk about your military experience. <laughs> yeah. Let's go there. The you Israeli sure? military, right? Uh -huh. What was that like? How did that, at a high level, how did that define... I guess some key some key things in your life in terms of mindset maybe in terms of sounds like practice well it defines everything in my life okay it's 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 who i am wow. uh it's kind of like what steve jobs said he didn't graduate stanford i think right but he took everything from stanford and implemented it in his day-to-day -day life so i'm the same way i was actually a seal and the israeli seal that trains with the american seal so i went through buds training and then I uh, left and became an intelligence officer. So I went to a specialty, a counterintelligence specialty, an officer. I was a lieutenant. And the entire journey of BUDS training to Officers Academy in Israel, it's a little bit the other way around. You have to be a soldier becoming, before you become an officer. So I was, I was a soldier. I was special operations. And uh, I've done the hardest that there is, presumably. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there are other yeah. good courses. Yeah. But... but Every single thing I did in butts training defines who I am and what I do now. I mean, I've seen 80% quit ratio. I've seen people mm. that were crying all broken because, you know, they've done something that was well publicized before. In other words, they went in knowing what, what, what they're going to have to go through. And still the mindset change and the dynamics change. And, you know, and I've seen, uh, I've seen amazing, the amazing experience of brotherhood when you actually grew with, with, with people that, you yeah. know, it just, it, it's so hard to even kind of like reflect and look back into the stuff that we, we've done as, as brothers in the military. And we implement all this as far as our mindset goes in our companies. Do you think it's all mindset? Do you think that's the, the one thing that you walked away from was that people who came in prepared, even though they had seen it all, but had the ability to either reach into part of their mind that was like, you're going to make this happen and just relentless or what part of the mindset would you say made people graduate and others not? It's pretty simple. Okay. Um, it's That's funny because you, you, you hear you hear it a lot in a lot of like sure. SEALs interviews and special ops interviews and, and, you know, different segments of the business. It's this gap between 
between giving up and, and being able to block that thought process, right? And when you go through hell week, and in Israel it's two, two hell weeks, so, right? Where you sleep for three and a half hours the entire week, and you probably walk five minutes of the week because the rest is running, swimming, diving, what have you. The only thing you need to do is to say, I want to quit, right? But if you're able to block and say, I will be okay on Friday, even though I don't know what day it is today because I don't sleep. So it's to me, it's just like Monday through yeah. very long Monday. <laughs> it's a seven days Monday. Sure. <laughs> but you just say, I don't care. I mean, unless Progress. my body gives up on me, I'll, I'll be here, right? Yeah. And that's a physical, mental mindset, which if you use it in business, you'll win. I mean, because at the end of the day, we all do the same. We all... You know, we all hunt, we all try to survive. And it's just a question of how much are you willing to push and not quit? That's the only thing that you need to add to the mix. I, I call that being in the room. And so I think a lot of entrepreneurs, they're in this room where it's almost like the imposter syndrome where they're like, am I really doing this? And they spend time not moving at all, right? And the obvious, so once you're in the room, there's two doors. One is like you quit, go back to getting a job, you quit your company, the other part of the room is like progress is, is like accepting that you're in the room, accepting you can't do anything about it and understanding that it's like you said, right? You're either going to quit or you're not. But a lot of people, I think entrepreneurs spend time in that room. And what, what you learn is that nothing gets accomplished in that room. Mm -hmm. You're just draining time, energy in your head. Mm -hmm. 100%. Right? Yeah. And, and not to be too philosophical, but if can, you can also date it back or kind of like, Ask yourself why, because I always I'm big on why. In the company, we always ask why, right? Like why? You, okay, yeah. Let's. I love yeah. this. Why yeah. would people go in and give up? Why would people uh, do what we do ninety nine point nine nine percent of the day, right? In business, and why do we need coaches? And why? And why? And why? I mean, and I think it starts from birth. And I think that it's kind of like a cycle where it starts with the parents. Now I'm a dad. And I just, again, maybe a 20th time say obsess over, but I obsess over the, the concept of raising the kids in a way that enables them to make a decision on their own. Like, for example, they know at this point, and they're 8, 10, and, uh, and, and, and a year and a half old, right? They know, well, the year and a half doesn't know him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not yet, but the 8 and 10-year-old, they know that their parents are not perfect. They challenge us all the time. I love that. Right? And I love that. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't tell him, respect your dad. Don't even think about it. Don't right. even think about, you know, asking why, why am I, why do you need to do chores? Why do you need to take the trash out? It's like, ask why. And I'll explain to you the logic behind it. Yeah. Right. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm big on that. And I think parenting I is the that. beginning. You know, it's interesting. So I've always heard about the, and I can't remember the official term for it, but it's, it's in different cultures, they learn either to respect authority or question authority. And the United States kind of falls like above the, the median in that terms. But Israel is one of the highest countries in the world in terms of questioning authority. So it's interesting that you are nurturing that in your kids as well. That that like always, no matter who it is, just question it as opposed to just uh, this is how it is, respect it. I it's, a, it's so true though you know yeah, i'm yeah. laughing because there's this famous saying that in israel you have seven million managers and seven million <laughs> officers i mean you don't you don't yeah that's oh, that's that's, that's a popular line <laughs> I, I have a friend who he raises he's a coder tech guy also he um raises his kids and he talks i mean it's the most beautiful thing i've ever seen really he'll tell them he's like it's it's, it's your first time being an eight-year-old right and mm -hmm. the, the kid's like yeah he's like it's my first time being a dad to an eight-year-old so like, help me. And what's amazing about that is they view, they still know he's his dad. I think America has this weird complex where like, if you do that, they're going to forget you're the mom and dad. And it's just not, I don't know where that came from. But what's beautiful about it is they, they're in it with him. It's like all of a sudden they're in the same problem together. Mm -hmm. And it's just beautiful because they know it. And it takes the pressure off of parenting, I think, and, mm -hmm. and trying to be right all mm -hmm. the time or whatever. Right. And it's really cool. I agree. And, and again, I don't want to be too philosophical, but you, you're saying oh, you America. Can do that. You can do that here. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I'll do it. Welcome, <laughs> That's why welcome. I like this show. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so we're in the room. G we're in the room now. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Vee said it very well. You know, it, it, it's to us, it's in America, it's a beautiful country and I'm an immigrant and I, you know, I, I've seen different countries and different lifestyles. America is a great country. The problem is that we're forgetting the foundations of it a little bit. Hmm. So it's kind of like a big corporation that is ran by executives that forgot what founders love is all about. So I think, again, 
great country, but I think that giving participation awards in games is is unnecessary, right? I mean, rewarding for doing that or, or, or kind of like what you said, you know, in the book, I mean, the book says I'm dad, then that's the process. And again, if you go back to our foundations or the country's foundation, you'll see a lot of, a lot of capitalists that always challenged authority, left yeah. the British, you know, came here and built great companies and great country. And, um, and I think that we need to, we, we, we lost it a little bit because the economy is good overall because this is a phenomenal country that has pretty much all of its shit square away square you know yeah. put together yeah you know if you're comparing comparing the country to any other totally. country Resources, i mean so it's amazing yeah. yeah so so once we cherish that and understand that hey i mean we shouldn't have the next generation take it for granted we'll be fine yeah and that's the part of where we need to have our kids understand that at some point they're going to be the one running this country without us around and if we put them in an incubator of love, 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 love. It's great, but they have to have a certain balance. You know? I just find that funny because it's so true. I find it so weird. I was born in Peru and in Peru at the time when I was love born, it. there's like two options. You were just poor or you were wealthy, but there wasn't anybody trying to help you, mm -hmm. right? It's like if you were wealthy, your, your odds of creating more wealth are higher. But if you were poor, it was just you. Like there was no government give assistance, no, no, no sort of like baseline. And so you'd see, I'd see kids my age when I was a kid, like out there selling crackers or whatever. And that was like so eye opening as a kid, mm -hmm. because to me, it was like, whoa, like we're not different. I was four at the time. And I was looking at them like they're me, like I played soccer with them probably. And just like connecting the two of equals. But yet society has set us on, on like different paths. Mm -hmm. But the reliance is on you. It was amazing. And then coming to America, it's like, oh, here's my chance to start over. Right. It's like, oh, here we go. Because mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's a, always something that's lived with me to this day. And continues to and it's just it's cool because it's also like you're charting your own path for your friends in your case for your family mm -hmm. right it's like they they need an example and so you are it every single day mm -hmm. for yeah. them yeah and yeah. i think that's like super powerful that's an amazing thing for me when when i remember in peru the synagogues i went to did yom kippur there the synagogues and the temples all and all the nice houses have like this this you know the fence, the fence. And the guards yeah and, yeah yeah and i'm thinking to myself why the gap is so huge and i mean and ultimately obviously again that's that's the beauty of the balance in this country uh, but I think that, I mean, we, we don't need to be so harsh on our, I think that we're overdoing it a little bit when it comes to kind of like bridging the gap. I think that, that ultimately there's a great balance between, you know, uh, poor and rich. And I know that there's probably, you know, a lot that we can do for homeless and stuff like that. But I mean, I think that ultimately as a country, we have a very well balanced economy that, that, that sure. empowers all, all sides of the market. Let's go back to, uh, the company. When you think about creating culture at your company, is it like an employee ownership program or how do you, how do you create a founder's mindset within your company for all of your employees? Do you spend a lot of time trying to do that? How, what incentives do you do the training? That's absolutely a, well, it's an awesome question, right? Um, it's something it's hard. I mean, that's a hard, that's the hard truth. Right. Any, everyone's trying to do it. Right. I don't think anyone, I had, you know, Very everyone's few are successful at it. <laughs> no, yeah. absolutely. And I think that I'm so proud of our teams. We're calling this, this schedulians, right? We won not only Inc. Fastest Growing Company in California for real estate tech, we're number one. Number Ooh. 21 in California is a, is, a, is a company and number 196 nationally. And that is going to sound super cheesy, right? But it would have not been possible without the schedulians. Um, so I think we're doing it pretty, pretty successfully. Um, and it's obviously starting thanks to the human resources process. And it's not because of the human resources, but it's because of the process, which is military style of basically selection. Uh, it may sound a little bit bad, but obviously to get into the unit, you have to pass assessments, cognitive abilities. Sure. All of that is tested, not just via, you know, verb, I mean, ver verbiage or, or conversation or interviews, but it's really uh, cognitive abilities. So uh, that's the first stop, the selection process. Okay. Uh, once selected, we really bleed the culture. That's our number one goal because you said it's difficult and it's absolutely difficult. And it's even more difficult when you don't have the budget of Salesforce.com and you're in Mecca and Irvine <laughs> sure. or LA and you have sure. to compete against a company that can just burn cash because they have it, right? So we, through training, really bleed culture, culture of not giving up, culture of kind of like military mindset. Our director of sales is an ex-Marine. So we're very much kind of like military guys. Structure, but, but, the structure you yes, put in place, yeah. The structure and the path to growth, the promotions, but... 
it it's the pinnacle of it is that we we respect so much any person that actually hits a certain time frame with the company. So once the loyalty is there on top of the capabilities, uh, we do offer ESOP, so employee stock options, and we want every single person that reaches that point to really see that company as their own company. So they have shares in the company, and uh, obviously it has its vesting period. And the idea is that at the end of it, as we grow bigger and and, and liquidate, they they have a certain amount of participation in it. Do you explain a tremendous like? Do you spend a lot of time explaining to employees what equity is and what it means to them and how it, like, quite literally, could transform their life in the future? Absolutely. We yeah. even take we even take a calculator and we break it down that. and we show this is the evaluation now, this is the evaluation next year, this, this is, is what, what it means worth. to you. Yeah. Yep. That's so yep. important. So many companies don't do that. And uh it's like they sign these equity you have to sign documents, obviously. Right. And they're like, I don't even know what this is. Uh, you know, <laughs> looks good, don't know what valuation means. So many companies do that, they have it wrong. Yeah. Um, so so with with us, the beauty of it and that that makes me smile every time it happens. Our team actually comes to us and says, Where when can I get the equity oh, nice. the ESOP. So show me so, the cap table. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. And we're happy to do that. <laughs> That's so good. One of the uh, the things on another podcast, um, super smart thing that we learned on the hiring process is they always wanted to make sure it aligned with their big goal. And so many people are just afraid to ask that question. It's almost like dating. People are so interested in being liked that they forget like maybe this person isn't good for me long term. Mm-hmm. Right. And in, and in the office, a lot of people forget like, if you don't want to do sales and I'm hiring you for a sales job because right. you want to be a chef someday, right? maybe this isn't the right move, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, and we, we actually take the approach of, so we narrow it, right? I mean, I used to say to people, are you ready to, are you ready to sign up for a, a three-year tour? So it's kind of like, again, a military yeah. term, but okay, we know that maybe you don't know, you probably don't know where you want to be five years or 10 years from now, 20 years, right? Life is very dynamic, but... Can you sign up for a three-year tour? Can you visualize yourself? Imagine that you're going to be here for three years. That's where you're going to be able to get to equity and more stuff and management. And that's kind of like how Because you're investing in them and you want to see that they'll stick around long enough to have a return on that investment. Right. One of the things that uh, I want to uh, circle back around and kind of bring it all together. One of the things that I've always heard about the SEALs is that they pride themselves on being experts on becoming experts. Are you familiar with that saying at all? Absolutely. Yeah. Is that something that you can teach people in your company? Like if there's a problem or a new area that you want to tackle, is that is that a skill set that you find that you're able to instill in, in your employees as well? That kind of like mentality where I may not know something about this right now, but by the end of the week, I'm going to be one of the most knowledgeable people in the room on it. That's an awesome question. And... It's an awesome question because the answer is going to be very contrary in answer. The <laughs> yeah, answer is yeah. no, you can't. Mm. And I don't say no, you can't often, but I think if you remember, I said the first step is selection. Not everybody is, is selected to go to SEAL training. And I think the reason is because mm. you cannot teach thinking. The moment you try to figure out how to make someone think, you're going to lose, right? There's a very... Um, I guess it's a blunt sentence that says you can't fix stupid. And it's true. You really can't fix stupid. I mean, you can tell someone, hey, think. That's how you think. But if you come with the foundation of strong cognitive ability, and in short, you're smart, you have the potential, right? Then yes, you can teach them tools and techniques, but you can't teach them to think. Let's talk about some of the hardships you've gone through. So quick, any any quick one, two stories you can share with people around any uh, tough times of your company's founding? So as an entrepreneur, yes, I had plenty and I'm happy to share them because I yeah, think yeah. that that anyone that says, well, I don't really recall, you know, it's kind of like the question, is, what's <laughs> yeah. your biggest weakness? Well, my biggest weakness is that I am a perfectionist. No, that's not a weakness. Yeah. <laughs> I care too much. <laughs> right. <laughs> think about a different answer. <laughs> so like I said, I, I, my biggest, my darkest times in life revolve around the DF era, right? The 2008 company that, okay. that basically led me to, it didn't lead me, it was the decision making process on my end. It led me to administrative actions and civil investigations. And, and it was just a nightmare. And it was, wow. uh, like I said, I mean, we, we, we said earlier, 
it was a derivative of having a, a mega successful company, right? At 27, you have a couple of millions of dollars that that's actually your share, right? Yeah. In net income and you, and you want to build a better business, a bigger business, and you want to grow from there. So you hire and you start to hire more individuals and, and, and you expand and uh, you, you hire a president that runs the company. And, you know, obviously, you know, soon enough, you realize that, that it's really hard to reverse those decisions. I mean, you cannot go back and uh, and run the company once you have the overhead, once you have this 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 executive that know how to cement a contract and have their right. golden parachute deals, and they have better attorneys than yours, or at least they've worked with attorneys for thirty years longer than you have. So you know, as a young entrepreneur, you you you're going to possibly be interested in finding that glorified investor or the glorified executive that's going to run your company or. Those are the key points, actually, that was, you know, for me were the biggest failure in my life. Was the thought process for you hire the experts? Like, did somebody tell you that? Did somebody, or did, what was the advice? Like, was it clear to you that you couldn't grow the company anymore, or you were just in such an unknown area that you needed to bring in people that seemingly knew how to do it? So I was very passionate uh, at a time to, to I don't want to compare myself to Steve Jobs, but I guess that's the best comparison. I was very passionate about coming with new products. I was very passionate about the idea of okay. evolving the menu of offerings that we have and rolling out a new investment approach. For example, in that in our space was investment products and different uh, funds, ideas, and, and real estate funds, which did very well. So you knew where your focus wanted to be. Yeah. Yeah. And and I kind of like delegated running the company Got for it. like Got better it. term. So, okay. so it's kind of like the Apple story, right? When you realize that, oh, sh- I'm, 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 yeah. I'm screwed. I mean, I'm, I'm too behind. I didn't pay attention the details now i see that that these guys are running the business to the ground and i have to figure out how am i going to answer questions right how am i going to solve that i'm the 27 year old guy but i am the co-founder that left alone as the founding member of the company i am the ceo on title so go explain why you're holding this title at 27 28 29 when the 60 year old is crushing your business so Again, I mean, I don't sound like a victim because at the end of the day, I'm at fault for all of this and it was my responsibility, but it's a teachable moment. And for sure. uh, the important component, if there's one thing you can take, not three, right? The important component is to know that when you start a business, know your product and don't ever give up on your business. I actually kind of like gave up advice. on the idea of managing it. Yeah. And that was my biggest mistake. But even having made that mistake, I think, and the reason really we started these podcasts and thank you for being honest is because here you are today with another company, successful, and that's important, right? It's important to say and, and really share that story. Here we are. Mm-hmm. Awful lesson. I can only imagine what that was like for two years of your life. I mean, oh. God you, awful. You, you have no idea how many Google researchers I have to this day that are, are, are Google researching me and judging me without knowing half of the story. Yeah. So so the results of your reputation, you know how they say you can, you can destroy your reputation in one minute, sure. right? Sure, yeah. Um, the result of that, that, that has been years in the, in, in the works, right? Yeah. And, I, and I fight day in and day out to A, tell the story and B, overcome those hurdles. I feel like I'm, I'm swimming against the wave in SEAL training again because Jeez. you got someone Google researching you and it said, oh, administrative action with the SEC from years and years and years ago. And you, I mean, you don't need to, even to, need to explain to them. You know, you just don't talk to them again, right? Yeah. So, so the idea is passionately as I can put it in words, right, is is you have to own the responsibility. As an entrepreneur, you're going to take the credits if you're successful, but you're also going to take the blame if you're not. Even if you hired the wrong person, it's not that person's problem. Right. It's yours because you hired that person. So you need to be okay with that. And that's, again, another influencer said it very well. You need to be okay with the criticism. You need to be okay also with obviously taking the, the credit. So on my end, my history for these bad decisions actually been trailing me for quite some time. And, you know, it's, it's, it's get diminished by the day because we're doing so much good work, but sure. that's something that people need to be ready, yeah. you know, to deal with. It's like you put it in your back pocket every day, extra fuel. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of love it. What else is on deck? Well, can you share a little bit about the future for set schedule? I don't know how much I can share, but I really want to share. I really, (laughs) really want to share. Cause I really want you to share. (laughs) So at the end of the summer, I like to say it this way. We've perfected the art of consumption. We democratize consumption for leads and CRM management on a very much complementary or minimal cost basis. We've perfected that. We have tens of thousands of agents and um, that's great. And at the end of the summer, we're going to perfect the art of collaboration. 
uh, collaboration okay. between a mortgage broker and a title officer and a real estate agent and a real estate brokerage and an interior designer. And we're going to do it through a very inexpensive, now, if not completely now free. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah, this, what kind of you, seed you is are, this? You are dangling something. <laughs> yeah, I can smell it. It smells good. I want to taste it. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I will I have to come back then in July. And I'll, exactly. <laughs> I'll share yeah. that. We'll have to do a re-release with an update. All I can say. Let's That's put exciting. it this way. I'm willing to guarantee you we're going to quadruple the amount of users in a period of three months. And, I, and I'm, I'm willing to tell you that there'll be, I'm, I'm willing to bet that there'll be a line of, 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 of companies that are going to want to acquire us. Not that we're interested, sure. but it's definitely yeah. the case. Or vice versa. At a high level, when you look at all the data, what do you see for the economy? You, I imagine you look at, you see the data, yes. right? You see a tremendous yes. amount of volume. Yeah. What is it looking like? What's the state? I just attended a talk. There's a PhD uh, economist and uh, says everything is super healthy. Mm -hmm. it's, he, he put it in a really nice way. He said, it's never been a better time to be a single mom in the United States. I would say this way though, for real estate, I'd say rent, don't buy. Even though it's kind of like contrarian advice. You to said you, rent or buy? Rent, don't buy. Yeah. Right? Because my- I, I say that to everybody <laughs> and everyone yells at me all the time. And I'm like, you guys don't get it. <laughs> Yeah. Give me your, maybe you can help me pitch this better. Go ahead. Tell me why rent don't, rent don't buy people. Because your return on investment uh, by renting now over the course of the next five years would pay a whole lot better than buying. Okay, so it's a pretty easy chart, right? You look at a chart and if you assume or if you believe that everything is great, yeah. like, like you know, sure. that professor said or whatnot or the economist, right? So if it's all great, you have at some point, you have to start walking down. Right. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a mountain, right? right? right. Yep. When you start going down and walking down, right, the high end property, especially in California, New York, Florida, what have you, are going to be the first one to get hit. And we see it in Manhattan. We see that sure. properties are staying, staying a little bit longer in the market, which is the mm -hmm. first indication that, right. that there's a little bit of a slowdown. So it's a balance between seller's market and a buyer's market. But if you give it enough time, I believe there'll be a 10, 20, 30 percent dip. In a price point, and if if you're patient enough and you can be cash rich, then you, you'll be able to to make a much wiser investment yeah. while you're renting and didn't pay property taxes and, and insurance and, and all the other. But it's counterintuitive. People have been taught their entire lives the, the you know it's the American dream, home ownership, the American dream. Work your way towards buying a house, and it is counterintuitive. And I, I've been hearing this from Diego a lot, <laughs> years, <laughs> years, yeah. And it's, it's almost like I've been hearing your perspective from more people uh, more and more over the past few years, but it's just now starting to fade into the popular train of thought like, oh, maybe maybe this isn't the right time to buy. Maybe home ownership isn't all it's cracked up to be because we are at such a high. I mean, that, that's, that's not return, easy to- Return on capital is what he started his statement with. Right, right, right. Which is really important. But it's not easy to convince people <laughs> going against years and even decades of being told the other way. All right, let's face it, okay? Yeah. So sell we, your house, we, sell your house. <laughs> sell Uncle your house, Roy, rent. Uncle Roy says sell yes. your house, sell sit your on house your cash, rent. rent. Yep. Start yep. a business, yep. put your money in places that yep. you can see it grow. 100% and stay cash rich <laughs> if you can. That's no, no doubt about it. Hey, I mean, look, you're talking about mistakes. I bought my first house at 23 and a half, almost 24, right? And I, in so 2004, give or take, right? And that house was sold for a nice short sale during the recession. I mean, I was upside down to $300,000. And I think at this point, it's still not worth what I had mortgaged against that property. So 10 years later. I, yeah. I, yeah, well, 16 years later, right? Um, but I short sold it. I sold the house in short sale. And 2010, 11, and 12, I managed a real estate fine fund while, while the other uh side of the business was run by by other individuals right and i had the best time of my life i mean the real estate fund was 30 40 percent you know cash on cash, cash on cash, cash return and and that was That's right insane. after the recession i mean we quadrupled you know asset values with a period of of 12 months and so now um, i have to ask you a question because of what i do i'm, I'm hoping this answer <laughs> aligns with mine <laughs> So if now we we're do. editing it out. I know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we're, we're canceling the podcast forever. Censored. <laughs> so what we do is we take all of our capital. And like I said, we buy these distressed assets. We fix them. We bring in a 10, 12 year triple net tenant, usually a brewery. And then we'll either look to flip that building with the, obviously with the lease in two to three right. years, or we will. So we're doing an opportunity zone deal. And so that one's obviously a 10 year hold. Smart, right? Put your capital in that. Smart, right? Yeah. 
You ask for confirmation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me confirmation <laughs> bias. <laughs> so, Genius. Is that what you said? <laughs> you know what? I mean, I'll, I'll be a friend here. I, I think that it's a great, I mean, I think I love the investment. I mean, the commercial properties, the triple net leases, you're talking the long-term play. This is yeah, not residential. Totally. It's not emotional. If the business is good and breweries are good because people would keep drinking beer even during recession. Yeah. Right. Actually, they'll probably drink more beer during recession. So your tenants are going to be strong during recession. Yeah. And I think that it's a good business because again, you have 10 year engagement. You're pretty much recession proof because everybody will drink and and maybe you'll go for a dip in, in, in the multiplier uh, during the recession, but you're going to have to weather it. You're going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Smart. Yes. Right yes. Yeah. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> I got vulnerable there. I was like, man, I don't know what this is going to go. Nick's also an investor, so it could have been bad for him. He would have been like, oh, what did I do? All right. So if you're a realtor, check out setschedule.com. Is that the and then at set schedule? Is the Instagram? So setschedule.com, your schedule is set. If it's too long, you can go to set.xyz. And uh, as far as the app, it's set schedule. Uh, yeah, that's where you go. Mobile app, it. iOS, Apple, Google. One of the fastest growing companies in America. Thank you so much for coming on. Right. Thank Appreciate you, it. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It was fun. We here at Startup the Storefront would love to hear feedback from you. Reach out and let us know what you think, either through rating us on the podcast app or by sliding into our DMs. You can find us both on Facebook and Instagram at Startup the Storefront. The team is comprised of Diego Torres Palma, Nick Conrad, Natalia Capolini, Megan Conrad, and Haley Nelson. Our theme song is composed by Double Touch. If you want to learn more about the products and businesses featured on today's episode, check out the links in the show notes. And if you enjoyed the episode, consider subscribing because we've got a lot more great guests coming up that you won't want to miss. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.